Good morning, everyone. Who here likes change? <laughs> There's a few people raising their hand. Generally, like in the morning service, there were several hands, but they're all really young. So they were not smart, wise enough to know better. This morning, there's somebody in the back who's quite old who raised his hand, said he likes change, but his wife is saying, no, he doesn't. She's saying he doesn't do well with change at all. So I'm not sure who to believe. We don't like change. Generally speaking, change is hard, yet we all change. You know, in high school, uh, you have these yearbooks, and very often people will write in the back of the yearbooks the notes to their friends, and they'll say, I love this about you. Don't ever change. It's not true. It doesn't work. We all change. Our looks change. We age. Uh, we gain life experiences. As we gain life experiences, we see the world from a different perspective. We change. So change is inevitable, but it doesn't change the fact that change is hard. That's a lot of change. We should use it in a different way. Word it in a different way, right? And in the last three months have been no different. Uh, there's been a lot of change forced on us, and some of those things have been difficult for us. An example of something uh, very simple that leads to the point I'm trying to make here is sometimes it's hard to change something as simple as our favorite shirt. Who here has a favorite t-shirt or cozy sweater, hoodie, something like that? Anybody? Okay. You know, it's interesting. Our clothing, and often particularly shirts, uh, what we wear on the top half of our body, have a way of identifying us. It almost comes like part of our identity. And here's an example of that. It's like I say to someone, hey, you know that Susie girl? Well, who are you talking about? Who's Susie? The girl that always wears that ugly red sweater. Oh, you mean that girl. Yeah, Susie. Now I know who you mean. See, as soon as you say the girl that always wears that ugly red sweater, then they know. Or you talk about, hey, who's that weirdo that keeps coming around? Who are you talking about? The guy that's wearing that Boston Bruins jersey. Oh, him. Yeah, now I know who you mean. Sorry, I'm just picking on you today. My brother-in-law picked on me yesterday, so I got to pick on him today. Our clothing, it, has, it says something about us, but we struggle. It's an example of how we struggle with change. But it's an example of how it so easily becomes a part of our identity. So we're continuing in our sermon series today on Ephesians. So today's sermon is called A New Shirt. You know, the book of Ephesians in so many ways is actually about change. It's about a change of clothing. It's about a change of identity. In many ways, it's about finding our true identity. Because God has given us a new shirt. So in the form, or for the reason of doing a bit of a recap, let's look at three verses leading up to chapter 4 where we are today. It's about going, talking about change, it's about going from being dead to be being made alive. Chapter 2, verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, and because of his great love for us, made us alive with Christ. So the change here is going from being dead spiritually to be made alive. It's also about being, in the one side, at war. We were at war with others. Uh, there was dividing walls of separation. We hated one another. We go from that to experiencing peace. Chapter 2, verse 14. He himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Another aspect of change that Paul talks about leading up to our passage is that it's about one, at one time we were strangers and foreigners. We felt rejected. We felt like we didn't belong. And we go from that to being citizens and being part of the family. Chapter 2 verse 19 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Meaning part of his family. So this analogy of clothing, I'm going to use it quite a bit today, but just keep in mind that an, an analogy is only an analogy. And they do fall short if you start picking them apart, but that's not the point. The point of using an analogy is to point to a bigger picture. So I just want to encourage you, don't miss the forest for the sake of the trees. So we're looking at chapter 4, verses 17 to 32 today. 
So what does life look like now that we've been made alive? Now that we've experienced this change, what does it look like that God has given us a new shirt? You like my shirt? It's a nice shirt, right? You might not all agree, but the point is it's clean. See, somebody's down going back there. I knew not everybody would like it. But the point is that it's clean. We've been given a new shirt. So what does life look like? Let's start in verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. So here in verse 17... Paul starts off again with the word so. At the beginning of chapter 4, verse 1, in a very similar way, he also says so, and he says, live a life worthy of the calling you have received, is how he starts chapter 4. But then it's almost like he kind of gets sidetracked. It's not a sidetrack. It's all intentional. Uh, but it can almost look like that, where then he takes 15 verses, and he explains how that as having received these positive new changes in your life, uh, the, and he expresses the importance of doing everything possible to maintain this new unity, that the dividing walls are broken down, that you've been made alive to do everything possible uh, to support this new family structure, uh, and who are wearing these new God shirts that have been given to them. So, your life should look uh, like a life that is characteristic of this new family that you're a part of. This new family that your new shirt says that you belong to. So here in verse 17, Paul says that he insists on it, that these new believers, these Christians in the city of Ephesus that he wrote to, that they no longer live as the Gentiles do. And by Gentiles, Paul is meaning in the generic sense, anyone who is far away from God. Paul is talking about people who have heard and received the gospel message and they've been given these new shirts, but yet uh, he's saying to them, be careful. And why is he saying this? It indicates that there's a possibility that even after receiving the new shirt and being part of a new family, that there's a possibility to still live like you're wearing that old shirt. That old shirt, which looks like this, full of stains, wrinkles, pretty ugly, and pretty stinky. Anybody want to try it? Come have a whiff or try, wear it for the service? Any volunteers? It's a pretty ugly shirt, but P- Paul is sh- telling us here that you've been given a new shirt, which calls for a new lifestyle. It indicates that it's possible, that there's a possibility to still live in the old way. And, and if we remember what Paul says in chapter 2, verse 3, he says, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. We were just like them at one time. That's how every single one of us was. So this is not about bragging rights. This is, we were all like that. And how do Gentiles live? They are living in the fut- futility of their thinking. And their, dark, their understanding was darkened. They didn't understand. I think this means humans who rely on their own understanding, and because they're relying on their own understanding, they don't trust God as a result. I think it's living by the principle that if God does not make sense to me, I'm going to just simply live in a way that makes sense to me. Their understanding is darkened and they're separated from God because of their ignorance as a result of their hardening of their hearts. That they were not open to the work of God in their lives. And because they're not open to what God had revealed to them, uh, whether it's creation itself, as Paul talks about in Romans 1, they're not open to it. And because they weren't open to it, their hearts became harder. And this state of life comes from a place of greed. 
is what Paul is talking about here. A place of greed when, where all you're, if all you're living for is for yourself, if that's the only thing you have in mind, Paul says this leads to a life of sensuality and every kind of impurity. There's a consequence. Humanity, humans, can never live selfishly and only for oneself without that lead, leading to something negative. Because we're not created to live for ourselves. We're created for community. And we're created for love. And love is not selfish. This is the old life. The life that Paul insists that they leave behind. The life that looks like this shirt. He insists on it that they leave this behind. That they take it off is what he is saying. If they were to continue living like a Gentile it would mean that they would be forgetting that they had received a new shirt and that they're part of a new family. Let's read verses 20 through 24. Paul says, That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We're called to take this off, but Paul is saying taking it off is not enough. He says you also have to put on the new shirt. The new self. Why? Because in Jesus, they have learned a new way of how to live. Paul says learned. Living the new life that Jesus demonstrated for them. He says you're learning this new way of life. How? By being taught by the truth that is in Jesus, is what Paul says. By being taught the truth that is in Jesus. There's an interesting thing here in this verse. It's my understanding that in all the times that the Apostle Paul says Jesus in his writings, and he says it many times, almost all of them he always says Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. But yet here, he just says Jesus. Why is that? I think it's because he's pointing to the Jesus that walked this earth as a human, that that Jesus, he showed us how to live. He demonstrated what love looks like. He demonstrated what it looks like to be part of the family of God. So it's a learned. It's learning to be made new in the attitudes of our minds. Did you notice that when he was, when Paul in verses 17 through 19 and now in verses 20 to 24, when he's talking and comparing the old and the new lives, the life that in both of them, he talks about thinking. He refers to thinking. Listen to again, again to verses 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And to put on the new self. The new life that Paul is talking about, it's learned, and we learn to change our thinking as we look to truth, as we look to Jesus, as we replace the lies in our, li in our lives with truth, as we replace darkness with light. It's a learned thing. And the Christian life is about transformation, being transformed in our minds. I just want to pause here and make several observations. The first observation is that becoming a Christian or that the Christian life and becoming a Christian is a process. Paul wouldn't have had to tell them this if it came automatically. It's a process. We look to Jesus, the person that we saw when we realized how sinful and ugly we were and that we needed a Savior. That same person that saved us and rescued us is the person that shows us how to live. As we look to him, we learn. In this process of learning and growing, theologically, the word is sanctification. 
that we become more and more sanctified, more and more like Jesus. Another observation is that this new self, these new clothes, or this new shirt that we're given, there's no indication here that this is earned. So when Paul talks about putting off the old and taking off the old shirt and putting on the new, he's reminding them of their new identity. He's reminding them of what Jesus has already done, that when we put our faith in his sacrifice on our behalf, he has already given us that new shirt. Paul is not talking about earning it. He's not talking about taking our old filthy shirt, all these stains and wrinkles, and trying to somehow iron it all out and wash out every stain and get that terrible odor out of it. Because we can't. We all try this. We all try to make our life wrinkle-free and odorless and look perfect from the outside. But we all know that without Jesus' help, we can't we usually end up making it a bigger mess and making it even uglier. So Paul is talking about the shirt we've been given. Another observation is regarding the mind. The old and the new, with both of them, Paul is talking about the mind and the body. And I think this points to that we can't separate the two. They're inseparable. It's kind of like a circle, I think. If you put mind at the top and body at the bottom, Whether you're living in the old or in the new, whatever the case is, how we think, how we view ourselves, what we tell ourselves, it leads to how we act with our body and what we do with our bodies. And what we do and how we act, it only reinforces, it comes back around the other side, and it reinforces what we think about ourselves. And here's the thing. It also applies to lies. So if your thinking up here is negative, if you view yourself as being a reject, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'm the biggest loser in the world, and those are the lies you keep feeding yourself, it leads to negative actions. You do negative things because that's what you believe. And once you do those negative things, you come out, out on the other side, and then you feel like a total loser because you made some really bad decisions again, And then those decisions make you feel like a loser, and it only reinforces what you thought about yourself, that you're a loser. And it's just a vicious circle. It goes around. But it's the same way when we receive Jesus, when we're given this new shirt, this new identity, and Paul says, be transformed in your thinking. Learn to take off the old and put on the new. Being transformed in our minds, replacing lies with truth. God's word is powerful. It's not just a textbook of words to memorize. It's life. It's truth. The reason why truth has the ability to set us free is because truth is truth. It doesn't lead us to bondage. It leads us to freedom. And those truths, it shines light on our darkness And that gives us the ability to make good decisions. And with our bodies and our lives to make good choices and to act in ways that reinforce who God says we are. But we can't get that backwards. We don't first act a certain way down here only to try to get God to accept us. It's in the realization of who God says we are, his great love, mercy, and grace, which we did not deserve, Through that, we allow it to transform our thinking and it changes our behavior. And I think this ties very much into the topic of mental health. I'm no mental health professional. All of you know that. Um, Someday in my life, when I have a better understanding of all of this or maybe more training or God reveals more things to me about my own journey, I hope one day I can talk more openly about my own journey when it comes to mental health. But I do know that a big part of mental health is our thinking. And so, sometimes when mental health is very poor among us or among people, it's as a result of just wrong thinking, believing lies, believing all sorts of negative stuff. But mental health issues also come as a result of trauma. It comes as a result of birth defects. It comes as a result of illness. And because of these things, Stuff like seeking help 
whether it's a counselor or a psychiatrist, and even taking medication. There is no shame in that, especially for believers. If we are children of God, and we realize there's negative th- stuff in our lives, and there's negative thinking, and we're struggling with just feeling all the time like I'm a loser when God says we're not, if there's some medical reason why that's contributing to that, and we take medication, but underneath it all, the motive for it is the medication is going to help us to process some of the root issues, to get help. There's no shame in that. And I think this speaks to that. Let's continue. Verse 24 also says, Put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This sounds a lot to me like what Paul says in chapter 1, verse 4. He says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. This says to me, I think it points to that putting on the new self is actually a return to the original self. When God created humanity and he said, it is, did he say it's bad? What did God say? He said, it is good. That was before sin entered the picture. So this remaking of ourselves through Christ, this new birth, this new life, this new identity, this new shirt, and our actions that should support and be characteristic of this new life, it's all just pointing back to the original. It's going back to how God created us and intended us to be. He says, to be like God in righteousness and holiness. That sounds intimidating. Because we know that we're in and of ourselves, we're not righteous like we would like to be. And we're not holy like we would like to be. But I think we need to remember that righteousness, biblical righteousness, is not something that we earn. It's something that's imputed on us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, in who? In me, right? It says, so that in me, it says in him, we might become the righteousness of God. In Jesus, not in me. The definition that most helps me understand righteousness And I'm sure this is not a full portrait or a full definition of righteousness, but it is a portion of it, and it helps me understand righteousness. It's this. To be in right relationship with God and others. To be in right relationship with God and others. And see, you know what the beauty of this is? In and through Jesus, because of his sacrifice on our behalf, through him... When we put our faith in what he has already done, we receive a right relationship with God. In our standing with God, we are put into a right relationship with him. Because of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. And then, the beautiful thing is, because of that, because of what God has done for us, made us right with him, extended his grace, mercy, and forgiveness when we did not deserve it, While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because of that, guess what? You and I all of a sudden can find the grace from God to extend forgiveness to others. All of a sudden, we can experience reconciliation with a brother or sister or neighbor or coworker or friend or ex boyfriend or ex girlfriend, you name it. We can experience reconciliation. And we can experience right relationships. This is a beautiful definition of righteousness. Right, being right with God and right with people. And this is what God calls us to. And he also says holiness here. And this word is intimidating because we think of the word holy as being perfect. And I think there is an aspect of that. And I'm not as good of a theologian as I would like to be. But there's a part of holiness that just simply means being set apart. And going back again to creation, God set us apart 
for a purpose. He did. And so being in righteousness and holiness means being right with God and others. And living in holiness means that we're living out the purposes of God for our lives. And you know what? I'm going to be very bold and even suggest that in our, imperfe- in our imperfection and in our struggle with this broken world and our own struggle with sin, we can even experience living holy lives in the midst of our struggle with sin. Because it's about being set apart for a purpose. So when we make a bad decision, when we even sin and we recognize it as a follower of Jesus, you know what the purpose for God and his holiness is for us? To confess it. And when we confess it, we're living a holy life. Not because we're perfect, but because we're living God's purpose for us. And I think that's part of what holiness looks like. And we're called to put that purpose on. But Paul tells us to put this all into practice. How do we put it into practice? We identify our old habits that are putting stains. You see this ugly shirt? So God gives us a new shirt. And remember, this is just an analogy. And I realize that when deep theologians like Ernest here would pick my analogy apart, they would find flaws. But don't miss the forest for the trees, okay? You see this old shirt, and you see the stains. Paul says, identify the habits in your life. Paul's talking to Christians. He's talking to people that have been given a new shirt. And he says, identify the habits in your life that are putting stains on your shirt. But I think the difference is that these are not permanent stains. I was tempted to bring a bucket of dirt here. And as I went through Paul's list, with every list, take a handful of dirt and just smear it on myself. You know what the beautiful thing is? It's still God's shirt. The moment I come to Jesus and confess my sin, he washes it away. And so Paul gives us some examples here. Let's read verses 25 through 30. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is help for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So which old habits are you struggling with? Do you, which old habits do you need to replace with good ones? Which old habits are making it hard for you to be in right relationship with God or others? Or which habits are giving people the impression that you're still wearing your old shirt? And Paul gives us, I don't think it's an exhaustive list, but let's look at what he says. Falsehood, telling lies. This includes half-truth. This, anytime we mislead somebody or intentionally do something to mislead somebody's attention to think something else, to give them a different perspective from what's the whole truth, it's actually falsehood. And Paul says it's, it's a habit that belongs to, to the old family. It's a habit that belongs to the Gentiles. Start telling the truth. Why? He says, because you're members of one body. It's not characteristic for the new family to lie to one another. That's not what the God family looks like. It means being honest, even when honesty hurts. It means being truthful. He talks about anger. Do you have unhealthy anger in your life? Is anger an emotion? I think it is, right? You know, men often brag. I'm not saying everybody. I don't want to put you all in the same boat. But often you hear men bragging or making a comment saying, 
I'm not near as emotional as women. Women are so emotional. Did you know that anger is an emotion? First of all, I think we need to remember that God has given us emotions, that emotions are not wrong or bad or sinful. It's what we do with our emotions. It's where our emotions take us to. Our emotions, as my counselor has told me many times, they point to that there's something else going on. They're an indicator. It's like God giving us a trigger pointing to that there's something else going on that we actually need to deal with. That's why our emotions are there, part of the reason. But when we take the emotion in the moment and we let it get out of hand, it can cause us to do things that we regret. And anger is one of them. So I think when a man loses his temper, it's not only men that do, but I'm just using that illustration. When a man loses his temper, I think he's being every bit as or more emotional than any woman that a man has ever criticized for being emotional. But Paul is talking here about unhealthy anger. And Paul says you need to stop it. And you need to learn how to deal with it in a healthy way. He talks about stealing. Are you dishonest? Dishonesty leads to a selfish gain. Stealing. And he says stop it. And he doesn't say just stop it. Stopping being a thief is actually not going far enough. Paul says to start working. Not just being a thief. Start working. Why does he say start working? He says, so that you can do something useful and help those who are in need. I think this is pointing back to the community aspect. Remember, the whole book of Ephesians is about the church. It's about the new body, about Jesus creating a new community, breaking down the dividing walls. And this is what should characterize this new community. And I think these... um, negative habits that Paul is pointing out is pointing to that when we do this, it harms the community. And he gives a positive here, especially with stealing, because we're called to help each other. He talks about having a filthy mouth. And I don't think this is just talking about swearing, uh, although that's part of it. It's talking about tearing people down. It's talking about being negative. He says, stop it. Stop tearing people down. Replace it with talk that builds people up, and that benefits people. Stop tearing people down. So maybe, an illustration here, this didn't go very well in the first service, maybe it'll go better now, I don't know. Uh, Maybe an illustration here would be, you know, you can talk about a product, like Ford, for example, and you can talk about how poor that product is made. Like, man, that's that's just a garbage product. But Paul is saying here, be careful what you say about those who, choose, those who choose to purchase that product. Right, Ike? Oh, he's not liking me right now. I'm going to hear it after this. Now, the point is, we are called to build each other up. And even when it comes to dealing with sin, dealing with negative stuff, we can approach those things in a way where we're building people up and not tearing them down. All these behaviors, they grieve the Holy Spirit with whom we were sealed for the day of redemption, is what Paul says. Why? Why does it grieve the Holy Spirit? Because when we live in this way like Gentiles live, we hinder God's best for us. We hinder the strength and growth and unity of the body. That's why. But also, it grieves the Holy Spirit because it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we were to go back to chapter 1 and chapter 2, Paul talks about that Christ was resurrected from the dead by the power of the Spirit, and that same Spirit is living in us. The reason we went from being dead to being made alive is because of the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So when we live in this way, we grieve the Holy Spirit Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is a spirit that's working in us. That's available to us to help us no longer live in that way. So when we live in that way, or when we don't ask for God's help, we're grieving the Holy Spirit because he's there. He was able to resurrect us from the dead. Don't you think he can help us with our habits and our hang-ups? 
Verses 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, among, along with every form of malice. Instead, this is my word. I put that word in there, but I'm not trying to add to the word of God. I'm just suggesting that instead of being bitter and angry and fighting and every form of malice, instead of that, Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. These, conclu- these last two verses of chapter 4, I think they beautifully summarize why we take off the old. We take off the old because they are not characteristic of the life that we have learned from Christ, which is what? He says it here, kindness, compassion, forgiveness. Why? Because we ourselves have been forgiven. If we have been forgiven, how can we withhold compassion and forgiveness from others? So Paul in all of this is saying, live a life that is characteristic of that. So to give up the old and put on the new is what we're called to do. To be renewed in our minds with truth that leads to the retraining of our bodies and our old habits. It leads to identifying the old habits and replacing them with ones that honor Christ and his body, the church. And then we repeat. Why do I say repeat? Because it's a process. Because if we're honest, sometimes we forget that we have a new shirt. Sometimes we forget what family we belong to. And we do and say and act in ways that are pretty embarrassing to the new family. But that's okay because the new family is forgiving and patient. We shouldn't hide because of that. But we forget that sometimes. And that's why we repeat. And that's why we remind each other of these truths. That's why we ask the Holy Spirit for help. That's why we allow the truth of God's word to transform our lives. But in order for that to work, we have to be exposed to the word of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, that there is power in your word. Thank you, Father, that you are a God of compassion, a God of love. And thank you, Father, that because of your great mercy and love, you have taken us from our dead lives of sin and you have made us new. Father, thank you that you have broken down the dividing wall of separation and that you have made us fellow citizens with you and brought us into your family to be part and to be one of your children. Father, would you forgive us for so often forgetting who we are and who we belong to? Father, we ask for your help and your strength to get rid of these old habits and to put on the new, the things that we learn in Jesus and that we are called to live in. We are called not just to live a life of going to church and trying to be a good Christian. We're called to be like Jesus and to love people. Jesus demonstrated for us what it looks like to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick, to visit those in prison. And this is what we're called to. So I pray as a family, we would recognize our calling and remember that, and that we would put on the new self and that we would not grieve your spirit, but rather that by your spirit we would be empowered to do what you call us to do. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you guys please stand as we sing the closing song?
5, verses 1 and 2, just allow these words to encourage us and also to remind us of who we are and also what our calling is. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Remember, you're a child. As dearly loved children. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I hope and pray you can be encouraged as you go forth to live and to build up Christ's body as we be the hands and feet of Jesus, as we minister to people in need, as we feed the hungry, and we do these things. This is what it looks like to live the Christian life. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Thank you.